Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. So today we continue on with verses 256 and 257, which read as follows. Natena hoti dhammato yena tang sahasana ye yoja at tang anatancha ubhoni jaya pandito asahasena dhammena samena nayati pare dhammasa guto medhavi dhammatoti pujati which means one is not a judge of the Dhamma because, uh, simply because one judges forcefully one is not a judge, a Dhamma judge, a righteous judge, just because one judges forcefully. Indeed, one who is able to judge both uh, what it uh, Cases and not cases. So if one judges cases forcefully, one is not a Dhamma judge. But if one judges both what are not, what are cases and what are not cases wisely, asahasena, without force, dhammena, righteously, Samena, uh, evenly, nayati pare, one judges others. One should judge without force, righteously, evenly, the cases of others. Thus one guards the Dhamma, Dhammasa Guttumi Dhavi, a wise one. Guards the Dhamma, Dhamma Toti Pujati. Thus, one is a Dhamma judge. So, this verse comes from a very simple story. Uh, though, though one with quite a good lesson, I think. Uh, the monks were. aware of judges in the society in which they lived. So when they would go on alms round, they would pass by the court. I don't know, maybe it was an open-air court in ancient times. Uh, and so it was a place where people would come with their grievances to have them sorted out by the appointed judges, judges who would have been appointed by the king, perhaps. Judges who had great power. And of course, as normal, this institution would have been highly respected uh, as a matter of course by the populace. It's given a reputation by teachers, by the culture, as being an institution of great importance, uh, of great um, esteem. You know. And so naturally the monks assumed that there were great things happening there, but one day they stopped and observed the proceedings and realized that in fact the judges were not judging impartially. In fact, they were taking bribes from rich landholders in order to sway their decisions. And often 
would end up would would decide in ways that ruined uh, the the less fortunate or the less um, affluent uh, of plaintiffs or defendants, causing ruin to uh, a great number of people, unwarranted stealing basically stealing their property and giving it to others based on bribes and and faulty decisions. And they were shocked and and very much disillusioned by the co institute, the the court in in the in in their area, and so they start. They were discussing this and and went to see the Buddha, I think, and or or the Buddha found out, and as a result, the Buddha remarked in this way. So. The story, the, the the topic, and today is about judging, which is a good Buddhist topic to talk about. First of all, we can make a brief comment on society and and remark that it seems to, of course, not gotten any better um, throughout the world. Corruption, of course, is rife in governments, in in legal institutions. We hear stories of, of people using religious views to bias their decisions. Uh, but of course also greed, anger, and delusion. But more importantly, of course, is how this relates to our own meditation practice. Judging is a good way to describe uh, a, a large portion of our activity as human beings. We're of course constantly judging. Judgment describes much of our interaction with the world around us. And so the Buddha uses this word forcefully to describe it, which I confess I, I have a hard time translating. Uh, I'm pretty confident in the translation, but if if you've ever read this verse in English, you've probably noticed they use the word arbitrary, which I don't think fits. And I don't really understand how it is a translation of this word that I don't really understand, I confess. Uh, sahasa, sahasa. In Thai they say sahat, sahat, sorry, sahat, sahat, sahat which they translated as, as something like forcefully, violently. Uh, but the idea of being forceful is an interesting one simply because it often is something that um, lends a, scent, a sort of credence. Right? If someone is expressing an opinion forcefully, it often is sufficient to convince your average person of, of the veracity of it. If someone says, I believe this is right or this is wrong, and they're very, they have great conviction, it can often sway people. Often someone who is a great orator, it often doesn't really matter what their, their, their stance is. People who, who train in debate, uh, politics, politicians can be quite good at swaying people based on emotional appeal. But it goes even deeper than that, and I think you could just use this word sahasa, and it is used to describe any sort of bias, any sort of biased judgment, where you force something. And so the idea that I get from this word is, like of forcing square pegs to fit in round holes. You, you, you can pretend that it's going to fit, or you can um, be convinced that it's going, and you can use a lot of force to try to get in, but it's not going to lead to a smooth or, or, or pleasant result. Or like trying to force two puzzle pieces that don't fit together. You have a puzzle and trying to fit a piece in where it doesn't belong. These sorts of analogies, I think, aptly describe the situation where 
you try to pass off improper judgment as proper judgment. And this example fits with a judge in, in the world who uh, pr presents an opinion or a judgment that goes against reality. They force it through. But we do this, this is a way of describing what we do quite often. We do this out of greed, we do this out of anger, we do this out of delusion. It's an important point because for these judges and for anyone who makes these sorts of improper judgments, even in their own personal life, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, how we judge experience, has often a sense of rightness about it. For a judge who is taking bribes, it's pretty clear they know they're doing something that is that is dangerous. But to say they know that it's wrong is, is I think, an oversimplification. Because, yes, they know it is seen as wrong by others. But a person who takes bribes like that, or any sort of addict, someone who does, who steals, and this is basically what these judges were doing, someone who is, who is addicted to anything and that causes them to act and speak in manipulative ways, uh, or even just chase after uh, objects of desire, doesn't have a sense that it's wrong. People who are addicted to, to smoking, addicted to drugs, addicted to pornography. They might hate themselves for it, beat themselves up for it, but deep down they don't think it's wrong. They are forcing through this, they are glossing over. It's like a grinding of the gears that they miss because of the power of the desire They only see the good, the good of it. This is why it's quite difficult for people to give up sensual pleasure, give up the things that they are addicted to, the things they want, the things they crave. Because their lack of clarity, the, the imprecision of their judgment, the wrongness of their judgment, where they judge something to be satisfying, a source of pleasure. Um, it, it provides them with a conviction, a, a sense of the rightness of it. And this is, of course, why, uh, a, a very important point, why it's not really possible for someone who is mindful to get caught up in this. When you're mindful, your, your addictions seem to melt away at the moment when you're mindful. When you try to mindfully smoke cigarettes, you find it very hard to be a, 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 attached to it. The desire seems to just melt away because there's clarity, because there's pre precision. And you can describe it as you're no longer just forcing through based on your, your, your belief, based on your, your imperfect perception, your perception of it as right. The greatness of mindfulness is that it gives you this clarity and the ability to perceive atang anatang, as the Buddha said, what is what is a case and what is, those are hard words. I, I had a hard time translating that. Atta and atta can mean case, like a you judge a case, uh, like a matter. It literally means something like matter, a, a subject, a topic, or something. But it also means benefit. So atta is that which has meaning, that which is meaningful, and anatta, that which is not meaningful, but it's extrapolated here to mean something like um, what is uh, right and wrong. So if something is, if someone presents a case to, before a judge, the judge can see that it has merit, they say, this case has merit. So that would be atta, it has atta, it has meaning, it's meaningful. If a case doesn't have merit, then they have to judge it against the person presenting the case. It's anatta. Right? So 
so that these kind of this kind of language it's just the good or bad uh, right or wrong kind of language so mindfulness provides you with that the ability to see through to see that taking bribes there's no universe in which that is right it's again it, it actually seems right to these judges who know that they're doing something quote unquote wrong but it seems right why because money is right me getting money is right i i i that is is the goal this is why people lie and cheat and steal the imprecision in their mind they are grinding the gears forcing through their 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 inability to see clearly is just keep providing them with a conviction that is able to just ignore all the stress and suffering and and wretchedness that comes from addiction uh, an addict is so blind to the consequences that it feels like bliss to engage in their addiction but any any objective observer outside even not someone practicing mindfulness looks at them and says what a wretch and and they're not wrong in saying that it, it's quite objectively clear this person is wretched suffering terribly in their bliss right this is i think the meaning of sahasa forcing and i think it's a really good uh, word a good way of describing what happens when you don't have the clarity of mindfulness so mindfulness again is just the simple act of reminding yourself it's just one moment and in that moment you adjust your perception right because this state of mind that is forceful that is just pushing through your based on your the narrative that you provide this is good for me this is my goal money or 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 pleasure or or whatever or conversely anger right some people can be feel righteous in their anger i read recently that there are buddhist monks actually um defending war and and killing and saying that some war is justifiable um based i guess on on this attachment to um society right if someone invades your country the the horror of losing your country this thing that you cling to can lead you to great uh, anger and and the, the the ability to kill in defense i think defense can be warranted but certainly not killing i think why someone would force through that opinion is they're not able to see clearly enough the distinction between perhaps say defending yourself and and uh, murdering someone else and so as a result there's i mean partially at least because of anger the aversion to to losing what you hold dear your country your society even buddhist countries often go to war and are very passionate about protecting buddhism which is kind of horrific to think about but on the other hand the buddha didn't spend a lot of time trying to fix society i think wisely he um didn't take sides didn't pick parties to follow or, or to support he praised people who were praiseworthy but much more than people he praised qualities that were praiseworthy to try to convince all sides to better themselves rather than taking sides and creating militaristic um situations but these states where we are caught up in greed and, and and anger and delusion are made up of moments and they're perpetuated by moments and so it may seem insignificant to sit on your meditation see it and repeat to yourself pain pain or anger or liking or or any of these things but you have to understand the again this nature of how our habits form and how they reform every moment that these are not uh 
masses or, or things that we carry around with us. They are processes. And they are processes that only continue by the perpetuation, the feeding of them. We feed them We feed them through our continuation of the habit. Our anger perpetuates more anger. Our greed cultivates the habit of greed. We, we, in, we like our liking. We, our anger makes us more angry and so on. And so every moment that we change this provides us with an alternative. And it provides us with a clarity. And so in that moment, it's like putting on the brakes and, and provides you with this self-reflection that is so much a part of meditation that allows you to see, how am I doing? How am I doing this? What, what is the state of my mind as I pass this judgment, as I engage in this activity? It allows you to see. And that's the whole point. Mindfulness leads to seeing, seeing clearly. It's quite, it should be quite apparent. You should be able to see from moment to moment that you're less inclined to engage in hasty judgment, irrational judgment, reactivity. You start and said, instead of reacting, going with it, to seeing your reactions. You start to be like you're watching yourself in horror <laughs> as you get angry again and again, as you cling again and again. And you see it, it, it wash away because you slowly, slowly stop feeding it. And you replace this forceful quality with a much more uh, or a similar sort of forcefulness as I think it possibly although I don't know about this word sahasa you could use it in a way that is not unwholesome if someone is clearly seeing the nature of their experience then there is a forcefulness still to their ac actions to their, their, their judgments but the force is the force of knowledge the force of understanding they simply see clearly. They see how smoking, a smoker sees how smoking is disgusting and, and really unpleasant and, and, and not uh, useful or beneficial in any way. Seeing that it is a cause for addiction, it is a cause for the stress and the, the suffering of withdrawal and so on. And so on. And same with, with, with anger. Uh, for example, with taking bribes apart from how it can lead to uh, criminal prosecution and so on, uh, vilification. Simply the, the insanity of the, of the cruelty of hurting other people, taking away their, uh, their property for your own benefit, that sort of thing. Just seeing all this uh, affects a great change in, in a person. But the, again, there is a great strength and so the force you gain a great force, a great um, uh, inertia, or, or what is the word, uh, a great power in your mind that is based on, on a stronger conviction. It's no longer grinding the gears, it's knowing that the circular peg fits in the circular hole and, and going for it without any doubt. Seeing that, oh wait, this one is square, this goes in the square hole putting things in the right place, simply because you see more clearly. That's the general principle of mindfulness and of vipassana. So I think that's the lesson that we can take from these two verses. And that's the Dhammapada for today. Thank you for listening.